So you're trying to decide between the Fuji X-T3 and the Fuji X-T4 and you're wondering if you need IBIS and this is a decision that I recently had to make and two and a half months into my ownership I'm not sure I made the right decision. First of all I'm going to take you through the key differences between the two different cameras and then I'm going to take you through a variety of different videos showing you the difference the IBIS makes using a variety of different lenses from the system. Now both cameras obviously have their advantages and disadvantages and yes the X-T3 does have some advantages to it even though it is sort of the little sister camera and the most obvious advantage of the X-T4 is the IBIS system but we'll cover that in detail later. Beyond that, the bigger battery, which is a pretty big deal because the X-T3 battery life is pretty poor, particularly if you try to use it in burst mode or boost mode, and if you're doing a lot of rapid fire shots or a lot of video. I must admit, I would suggest that a normal person would need between three and five batteries for a normal day of shooting, where the X-T4 is probably gonna do that same shoot to one and a half to two. So so there is a big difference in the battery life. The X-T4 also has a stills and movie switch. It is a dedicated switch on the camera which allows you to switch between the two different modes and save the settings. So this is an issue with the X-T3. When you dial it back and forth, you are uh, overridden with the knobs on top which are locked into your different settings where with the X-T4 you switch, it saves your video settings and then when you go back to stills, you're back onto the knobs for the activity that you're doing there. So it does make it for someone who does switch between stills and video a lot, it is a significant advantage uh, that you get out of the X-T4. Along with the IBIS system and the bigger battery, it also facilitates a deeper grip. So if you feel like the X-T3 and the X-T2 have just a, a bit of a shallow grip that isn't as comfortable for you, then I think you would find the X-T4 a much better grip. And particularly if you're uh, using a wrist strap or holding it down at your your side a lot and you've got a, a decent sized lens on it there is a significant advantage to having that deeper grip of course there is the flippy tilty screen which is a, a really big deal on YouTube and I think I think the flippy tilty screen gets made a big deal of on YouTube because there's so many vloggers and people that are are videoing and looking themselves but I think for the average user this is much less of a big deal but if you are somebody who plans on filming yourself then this is a huge huge advantage having that screen that you can turn around and look at yourself. If you're doing this with the X-T3, you're either shooting blind, you're shooting with a mirror mounted on top of the camera so that you can see the screen as it's flipped out, or you're shooting with a monitor. And none of those solutions are even close to as good as having the native flip screen. And the other one the X-T4 has is a new 240 frames per second mode in video. Now, most of the stuff you see on this says that it really isn't very clear. It is kind of a gimmick. There's a bit of artifacting, but it is something that is usable, and particularly if you're just sharing it on social media and publishing it so people are going to view it on phones and tablets, it's probably good enough for something like that. But it really isn't a serious video maker's tool in my book. And for me, I would rather have a clean 120 frames per second rather than sort of a muddy artifacted 240 frames per second. Now onto the X-T3, and the most obvious advantage to the X-T3 is the price. Uh, depending on what sales and deals are going on, you are going to get the X-T3 for approximately $500 less than the X-T4. Also keep in mind you have the same sensor and same image processing engine, the same autofocus abilities. So a lot of the strengths of the X-T3 right off the bat are how much it has from the X-T4. Uh, when you strip it down, there are so many shared components uh, to these two cameras. Forgetting the IBIS and you put them both on a tripod and you shoot a video or photo, you will not be able to tell the difference. So depending on your setup, you will be able to produce the identical results to the X-T4 with the X-T3. Another argument I hear with the savings of $500 is, a gimbal is far better than IBIS if you're willing to carry around a bigger, heavier gimbal. Obviously, an IBIS system is far more convenient, but 
The $500 will buy you nowadays quite a good gimbal, and an X-T3 on a gimbal is gonna have a lot more stable, far more cinematic footage than you'll be able to get out of the X-T4 with just its IBIS. Now, the other thing is, depending on the way you shoot, the tilt screen rather than the flippy screen is an advantage to a lot of people who shoot photo and video particularly if you're never gonna shoot a video of yourself because it allows you, particularly for waist level shooting, which is really a great way to shoot photography and video, to just pull that screen out and you're locked in, you're ready to go. When it is uh, tilted out like that, you are able to hold both sides of the camera for stability, where with the X-T4, to do that waist level shot, uh, first of all, you've gotta flip the screen out and tilt it. Then you're holding the camera so you're holding the side of the screen or in some awkward way holding the bottom and one side. So if you are a waist level shooter or even an overhead shooter, you are really going to prefer the screen on the X-T3. In addition to this, the X-T3 is a little bit smaller, it is a little bit lighter, so if you're interested in, in these APS-C size sensor cameras, uh, a lot for their size and lightweight, well, you're getting a little bit of smaller size and lightweight with the X-T3. Of course, the X-T4 isn't huge by big DSLR terms, but you will find a, a noticeable weight savings going with the X-T3. And one of the things that really surprised me is the new X-T4 does not include a battery charger. So the X-T3 comes with a battery charger like just about every other camera on the planet. But the X-T4 is not only $500 cheaper, but it just comes with a power adapter, which means you have to charge the battery through the camera and when you look at running that current through your camera every time you want to charge a battery it's got to go through the full width of the length of the circuit board to get to that battery that's really not a way that i want to be using up the useful life of my camera and the components in the camera compared to using a cheap more disposable battery charger so I think that is kind of a big deal, and the battery charger, to, to get it separately with the X-T4, uh, it's not cheap. I wanna say it's somewhere between 60 and $100, so you have to add that on to the extra cost of owning the X-T4. So those are the key differences that I have identified, and now I'll tell you about the IBIS, and whether I made the right decision with the camera I bought. After playing with both the cameras in store and thinking about the way I shoot, I eventually went with the X-T3. But recently, I came across some camera gear that I was buying and selling because I do a lot of stuff on eBay where I buy and sell cameras through uh, Craigslist and, and different ways that you might buy and sell camera gear. I mostly buy uh, batches of gear and then part it out. And I ended up having an X-H1 on my desk, and I had access to that for about a week. Now the X-H1 IBIS system and the X-T4 IBIS system are very, very similar. Now, there is almost no difference in the level of stabilization. I think it might be rated at 15 or 16% difference. It is quite small. Uh, the real difference between those two cameras is they make the made the IBIS system smaller for the X-T4, so they were able to fit it in a smaller body and make a smaller camera. But for the purposes of this demonstration, I thought, I'm gonna take my X-T3 out, and I'm gonna take this X-H1 out, and I'm going to take a series of about every lens I've got and shoot them side by side in a number of different situations and see what you really get with IBIS versus non-IBIS. We're gonna start the footage now and I will talk you through it and then at the end I'll come back and tell you what I think and who I think should buy the X-T4 over the X-T3 or the X-T3 over the X-T4. Now here's the first shot with the 50 millimeter F2 with the IBIS on and you, as you can see this is a very stable shot, completely usable for video, looks really good. And here once we've taken the IBIS off, really that's completely unusable, that's 
pretty horrendous, really. Now we're on to the 35 F2. Once again, quite a good shot. As we go through these, what you're gonna see is the longer the focal length, the more the IBIS makes a difference. So this one is quite unstable. Once again, not usable, but certainly better than what the 50 was. Now we're on to the 23 F2, and you can see the IBIS even makes a bigger difference with the lower focal lengths because that's just rock steady. And then with the non-IBIS, yeah, we can see that, yeah, that's, that's quite unstable, but we're moving in the direction towards a usable image. You could probably stabilize that in post. Now here I decided to try a panning shot because often IBIS can cause problems with panning shots or is known to cause problems with jumping and panning shots. But what I found is this IBIS was extremely smooth and the non-IBIS, you can see the image popping up and down. So I'm keeping the pan reasonably smooth, but it's sort of moving up and down as I pan. Here's a 35 mil F2. This is more of a close-up shot. It just shows you the difference with when the uh, subject is closer. And once again, the non-IBIS is extremely shaky and I wouldn't be happy to use this image. Now here is an image stabilized lens. I'm just uh, focused on this hole in the tree trunk. And as you can see, both images are good. The IBIS obviously does a fair bit, but the non-IBIS was completely usable. Once again, same lens with the IBIS. It's quite steady, not perfect. And then the non-IBIS, not a huge difference here. It's obvious that the the uh, image stabilization of the lenses does a pretty good job. Uh, here's a panning shot. I can't remember which lens I had on for this shot. So I've just labeled it panning shot. Um, and uh, this is an image stabilized lens for sure. Not a huge difference between the two. All right, now this is the X-H1 at 10 millimeter on the 10 to 24 image stabilized lens. We've got the image stabilization on in the lens and the body now. So. We'll see if this makes any difference or if the footage is any smoother. Um, I mean, really it should be. I think it's supposed to get you a couple more stops of stabilization. And I think it may actually stabilize the sort of torquing of the image as well. All right, 10 millimeters vlogging test. This is the Fuji X-T3, just handheld. And I don't even have any sort of tripod or little mini Joey pod to kind of hold the camera and the lens steady so this is just the image stabilization in the lens alone and I'm not walking overly carefully either now we've got that same shot at 14 millimeters and it'll be interesting to see how well the X-H1 versus the X-T3 does with keeping my face in focus they both so they both have face and eye detection and I've turned them on in both cameras uh, in theory, the new X-T3 should be a little bit better, but maybe in a shot like this where your sort of face is in the center of frame, it might not make much difference. Now, this is the same shot, but at 13 millimeter. I think 10, mil 10 millimeters is actually awfully wide for a vlogging shot, and sort of around that 12, 13 millimeters is actually kind of the sweet spot for taking in the environment around you, uh, but yet still getting a halfway decent sort of normal looking shot. Now this is the 90 millimeter F2 with the IBIS on, and this is stunningly stable for a 90 millimeter lens with no image stabilization in the lens. And you're gonna see how big of a difference there is. I mean, look at this, this is, horrendous wobbly jello really unusable i was stunned by the difference the ibis made on this lens just incredible now here's a close-up uh with the 55 to 200 uh here's with no ibis and you can see this is pretty good i was i was sitting in a pretty stable position but yeah it did a great job the, and the ibis maybe it's a little bit more stable but i wouldn't have said that there was a huge difference between these two shots now we're on the X-T3 with the 16-80 to and you know one of the interesting things with both of these cameras is I can't see the viewfinder or the screen so I have no idea how these shots are turning out. This should be a pretty good lens for this type of shot even on the non-image stabilized body because it has the best image stabilization of any of these mid-range zooms and it is the most modern lens. All right, now we've got the 16 to 80 millimeter on and we've got it at 16 millimeters, which is where you would use this lens for vlogging. 
The image stabilization in this lens is already pretty good, but once again, it doesn't take out that twist of the image, which the image stabilization in the X-H1 really should. And this is the kit lens on the X-T3, the 18-55 f2.8 to f4. Once again, I can't see my framing, and 18 millimeters is closer than I think is ideal for vlogging, but uh, you certainly can do it, and if this is the only lens you've got, to buy another lens just to get a couple of millimeters out of it might not be worth it for you. Now we've got the kit lens, the 18-55, to and I think 18 millimeters is a little bit too tight for vlogging, and beyond that, since I can't actually see the framing, that can make things a little bit challenging, but uh, yeah, it will be interesting. I figured a lot of people this is the only lens or the main lens zoom lens they use So we should test both of those. So here it is on the X-H1 And for these last two shots I just decided to do a running test to just kind of see what it what it looked like and uh, I don't know here's the non ibis shot and then running with the ibis you you can see it does make a difference it's no gimbal by any means, but it certainly makes quite a significant difference. Like, yeah, it's a difference. All right, so as you can see there, with the image stabilized lenses, which when I bought the X-T3, I thought, well, I'm mainly gonna use image stabilized lenses. There is a difference, but it isn't huge. But importantly, where the X-H1 or the X-T4 makes a difference, is in this motion. It takes this tilting out. And if you're trying to shoot cinematic video, something that really looks like it's uh, fit to go on a Hollywood screen, this ruins the whole thing. And it is quite difficult to hold the camera so steady that you don't get any twist like that. But the IBIS system in the X-H1 and the X-T4 and even the X-S10 takes that twist out and that really makes a difference on the image stabilized lenses and that is something that I really didn't take into account or think about when I went with the X-T3. The other thing that is it's just this is really in my mind the game changer of an IBIS system is it takes all these super fast prime lenses these sharp high quality prime lenses that Fuji produces and it turns them into video lenses and if you looked at the footage it was obvious that most of if not all of the prime lenses are not usable for video handheld on the X-T3 unless that is the look you're going for unless you are going for a handheld shaky look but I would suggest most of the time you aren't. And the only one that I thought was really halfway usable was the 23 millimeter F2. And the farther you get out, the more stable the image becomes. But even that 90 millimeter F2, I was stunned by how good that was on the X-H1. And it was absolutely horrendous on the X-T3. So who should buy the X-T4? Who should buy the X-T3? Well, I think if you are a stills photographer primarily, I think the X-T3 is probably good enough. Uh, because if you take that extra five, $600 savings that you're getting from getting the cheaper camera, you don't have to buy the battery charger, you have a screen that is more suitable for photography because you don't need the flippy screen. Take that money and buy yourself a, a couple of used prime lenses or one new good prime lens from Fuji. And that is gonna give you the extra speed you need to freeze that image without the IBIS. So for a photographer, I'm saying, XT3, save your money, get another lens. If you are a videographer and you don't want to use a gimbal, and I think that is the caveat here, because if you want to use a gimbal, buy the XT3 and buy a gimbal. Because there's a lot of demos online, using a gimbal with the IBIS system actually is a mess. You have to disable the IBIS system when using a gimbal, or it will, it will effectively ruin the footage. So, video maker, 
XT3 with a gimbal, great setup, do that. Handheld video shooter. By buying the X-T4 and getting the IBIS, you take all those great prime lenses that Fuji makes and you turn them into video lenses. And that is where I feel like I really made a mistake. And if I had it to do over, I would definitely buy the X-T4. All right, I hope that was helpful to anyone who's trying to make this decision. Thank you for watching. Stay creative.